Hi, this is Kim, and this is a quick lecture about enzymes. We've already talked about enzymes a little bit, and we've even given specific examples of enzymes. So remember that enzymes are proteins, and because they're proteins, they have a very specific three-dimensional shape. So this is an example of an enzyme. It's called alcohol dehydrogenase. We have talked about digestive enzymes. We are going to be looking at an enzyme that's involved in cell division. We are going to be looking at enzymes that are involved in DNA replication, mRNA transcription. There are a lot of different enzymes we will talk about this semester. So it's important to realize that enzymes are very specific in their shape, and therefore there are no generalist enzymes. They're all very specific to the reaction that they're catalyzing. This alcohol dehydrogenase is the enzyme that takes ethanol in alcohol that you drink and converts it to a form that's actually toxic and makes you sick. So if you drink too much alcohol, the alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme is going to convert that into acetaldehyde. And this is very toxic. Luckily, this doesn't stick around for too long. Sometimes it seems like forever <laughs> if you're sick from alcohol. But there's another enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase that is going to convert that acid aldehyde to something less toxic called acetate. And eventually that breaks down into water and carbon dioxide. So enzymes play a lot of important roles in our cells. In fact, you know, I looked up how many different enzymes do human cells make, and there are all kinds of different answers on the internet. So I am not sure what the exact answer is. Some websites said 1300, some said over 2000. So just know that we make a lot of different enzymes for carrying out key reactions in the cell. Because these are proteins, they do have a very specific range of pH and temperature in which they are active. And are above or below that pH or temperature, those enzymes become denatured. This shows the optimal temperature and the optimal pH for a specific enzyme. And you can see that the, the activity of that enzyme is highest really at that optimal temperature and at that optimal pH. So this would be the range of pH that's optimal, whereas this would have one specific temperature that has the highest pH. And then, you know, too much above that and too much below that and you're going to get less enzyme activity and eventually no enzyme activity at all as that enzyme becomes completely denatured. Another factor that can affect enzyme activity is how much enzyme you actually have. And we'll look at that slide in a minute. What do enzymes do? <laughs> well, specifically enzymes reduce the amount of activation energy needed to cause a reaction to occur. So chemical reactions, even if they are exergonic, require a certain amount of energy to get started. And for those reactions, even if it's something that is going to release energy, you need a little bit of energy to get started. The way I like to think of it is even if you have a boulder at the top of a hill, that boulder might not ever start rolling on its own. It needs a little push. And you can imagine that it, pushing that boulder up the hill is going to require energy input, but it's also going to need a little energy to get started before it can roll down the hill. And that is the activation energy. And I apologize, this A in a previous slide was correctly a superscript. Activation energy, also called energy of activation, it would be an E with a superscript A. So it should actually be written like this. So E, this is my nice writing with my mouse here. <laughs> E superscript A is how that should be written. What enzymes do is they reduce the amount of activation energy needed. So here's an example. This would be the amount of energy that's required to get from the reactants to the products without an enzyme present. So you can see how much energy that is. It's you know, really this much. And look how low that is with the enzyme. So the enzyme is going to facilitate that reaction. If you go on to take a higher level biology class, you will see the different ways that this enzyme accomplishes this. And I will just really talk about it briefly in the next slide. So some important terms that you need to know. 
the area of the enzyme that the reactant in a chemical reaction binds to is called the active site of the enzyme. It has a very specific shape that will typically only allow one reactant to bind. That reactant, if an enzyme is involved, is called the substrate. So the substrate is really the reactant in this reaction. It's called a substrate because there's an enzyme in, involved. And you can see that the substrate binds to the active site of that enzyme. Now, a couple of things are happening here. One is that this enzyme is holding that reactant in the exact perfect orientation for this reaction to take place. In this case, what's going to happen is that sucrose is going to be broken apart by this enzyme called sucrase into its two separate monosaccharides, glucose and fructose. For that bond to break, that enzyme is holding that reactant called the substrate at the exact perfect orientation. You also see an important term here called induced fit. What this means is you can see that that substrate isn't just loosely fitting into the active site. If you look at the shape of the active site here, compared to the shape of it here, you can see that it has changed. So really that enzyme is squeezing, putting slight pressure on that bond, allowing it to break with less energy required. Remember that breaking this bond is going to require a reaction called hydrolysis. So there's going to be water involved, but that could never break apart without that enzyme. There just wouldn't be enough energy available. So that's how if you don't make lactase enzyme, that lactose sugar never breaks down into glucose and galactose. Because if you don't make enough enzyme to carry out that reaction, it, it just will not happen. So the substrate is converted to the products, the products are released. And this is important because now that enzyme gets recycled, you can just keep using it over and over. If you have a lot of substrate around, you'll start making more enzyme. And over time, you can just really keep making more enzyme and get that reaction rate to increase. But at some point, there's only so much substrate available. So increasing enzyme concentration can increase reaction rate but at some point saturation is going to occur. So you can see here, it's increasing, increasing, increasing. And then at some point it starts to level out because now all of the substrate has bound to an active site of an enzyme and you can't really increase the rate anymore. This is important if you end up doing a lab exercise in your biology class that has you look at the effects of enzyme concentration on reaction rate, how fast that is taking place. Another important thing to realize is there are a couple of ways you can determine whether a reaction is going from reactants to products. You can either do that by looking at the disappearance of a reactant or the appearance of a product. Those are two important things to realize when you're carrying out um, experiments involving enzymes. So again, when we're determining the rate of a reaction, you can do that two ways as well. You can look at the rate at which a reactant disappears, or you can look at the rate at which a product appears. Both of those would indicate that that reaction is taking place. So for example, and I'm sorry, this is going to be mess messy writing. <laughs> if you were looking at this specific reaction. So this is hydrogen peroxide. It's pretty toxic to our cells, and yet we make a lot of it as a product of certain chemical reactions in the cell. And we want to be able to break that down. In order to break that down, it's going to require a specific enzyme to convert that to water and oxygen. And that enzyme is called peroxidase. It's also sometimes called catalase. So depending on what class you're in, <laughs> you might do an experiment with peroxidase or you might do an experiment with catalase. I more commonly call it catalase. This is the 
older name for this enzyme. Regardless of what you call it, this is a very important enzyme. If that enzyme is not working, hydrogen peroxide doesn't get broken down. So we could measure the rate of that reaction either by how fast this reactant is disappearing or how fast one of these products is appearing. The cool thing about this reaction is that oxygen forms bubbles. So you can really measure the, the rate at which oxygen is being produced by measuring the rate at which bubbles appear. If you've ever put hydrogen peroxide on a wound and you've seen the little bubbles appear, that's the oxygen getting released. So you've seen that already happen. So this is just one of thousands of examples we could give for an enzyme causing a reaction to take place. And this is just really pointing out a couple of ways that you know it's taking place, looking at the disappearance of a reactant or the appearance of a product, or you can look at the rate at which it's happening by looking at the rate, in other words, how fast this disappears or how fast one of these two appear. Some enzymes actually require cofactors in order to work, and this is a really cool example. So for this substrate to fit into the active site of the enzyme, it needs this coenzyme to attach. So this coenzyme is also a cofactor in that it, it needs to fit in here in order for the substrate to be able to bind. And a lot of the vitamins and minerals that are in your diet are actually cofactors for enzymatic reactions. We have a lot of key reactions that can't take place if that cofactor isn't bound to the enzyme in order for the substrate to be able to bind and have that reaction take place. We don't want reactions happening all the time though. So just because an enzyme is present doesn't mean you want that enzyme to always be active. We're going to look at a really cool example of that when we look at cell division. So there's an enzyme that's going to cause the sister chromatids to separate, but we don't want that to happen until a key stage in cell division after a certain checkpoint takes place. So we have what are called enzyme inhibitors that control enzyme activity. And there are really two categories of these enzyme inhibitors that control enzyme activity. Again, this is to keep enzymes from being active at all times. What's called a competitive enzyme inhibitor so here's the competitive inhibitor. It actually binds to the active site of the enzyme. So that substrate can't bind because it's being blocked by this inhibitor. As soon as that inhibitor is released, now that substrate could come in and bind. So this is one way that we can control enzyme activity. Another way is with something called a non-competitive inhibitor. Now that non-competitive inhibitor binds somewhere else on the enzyme, not to the active site. And when it does so, it changes the shape of the active site. So you can see this is kind of pinched in a little bit. And now that substrate, it can't, it can't bind because the shape is different. Sometimes that non-competitive enzyme um, inhibitor is called an allosteric inhibitor, and it binds to what's called the allosteric site on the enzyme. So if you go on to take microbiology, you might see this term. This is an important term when you start talking about antibiotics and how antibiotics work in inhibiting the reproduction of certain bacteria. So allosteric is a non-competitive inhibitor, does not bind directly to the active site. A competitive inhibitor would be one that would block this active site and keep that substrate from binding. Enzyme inhibitors are important in our body, but we also make a lot of products from enzyme inhibitors. Antibiotics, I just mentioned. We have antiviral drugs. So in our fight against HIV in particular, we have a lot of antiretroviral drugs that really have been successful in stopping that virus from replicating to the point where a person um, can die. So antiviral drugs that are enzyme inhibitors are incredibly important in our world. Antidepressants, there are certain categories of antidepressants that are enzyme inhibitors, certain forms of chemotherapy that are enzyme inhibitors, and we have pesticides and poisons that are manufactured that are enzyme inhibitors. So those are the enzymes.